we're definitely going to be talking about truthfulness today. And that's what's so great about the, the This Is Us series, is that it does seem to be true. They don't seem to uh, glaze over certain truths that happen in our own lives, and that's why it hits home with a lot of people. And I think if the church is going to speak to our culture, it's got to hit home with people. It can't be fake, it's got to be authentic. And Christians have to be willing to speak the truth. But more importantly, speak the truth clarified in love. You know, I think one of the biggest fears that we all have, especially guys, if you hear this question, do I look fat in this? <laughs> I mean, I'm like, have you ever seen that Twix bar commercial where she, the, 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 the lady asks that question and the guy goes to answer and he just shoves a Twix bar in his mouth just to cover up the question? Angel, Angel doesn't ask me that. She usually says, does this look okay? But sometimes she'll ask me about the kind of pants that she should wear or the kind of shoes that she should wear with her outfit. And she'll ask me which one. And I'm like, dude, you're asking the wrong guy. Okay, you're asking the wrong guy. I'm somebody who really doesn't know how to dress that well. Angel usually picks out my clothes. And so, but what I know about my wife is this, she knows that about me. And so she'll ask me which one, and I know the one that I select is not going to be the one that she chooses. She's going to choose the opposite. And so I use reverse psychology, and I choose the one that I don't think that she should have, so that she actually chooses the one that I think she should have. And so if she's here, she knows my trick now. But she will. She'll ask me, she'll say, hey, Rick, which one should I wear? Which shoes look best? And I'll say those. And then five minutes later, she comes out with the other pair that I've told her to wear. And so after a while, I'm like, huh, I'm going to catch on to this, right? But we should speak the truth in love. That's what, that's what we're called to do. And words are very, very powerful. I mean, if you go back to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the very first passage of Scripture deals with God speaking. The Bible teaches that God spoke the world into existence and all space, time, and matter came into being through the words of God. The Bible also talks about how Jesus is the divine Logos, the word of God, and he was the one who actually brought the world into existence in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. I mean, words are powerful. And everybody in this room that's lived any amount of life will know how powerful words are. The Bible is filled with how words impact our lives. For instance, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, that, it says this. Follow along with me if, if you have your Bible. It says, the tongue can bring life or death. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Words can be sharp. It's like a sword, for instance. Swords can pierce and cut. And often, even though the wound heals, what do you have left over? You usually have scars, things that remind you of the words that were said to you throughout your life. And so that's why, for instance, married couples, if you tell your spouse that I hate you, I wish I was never married to you, you're the worst thing that has happened to me in my life, I should have never have entered a relationship with you, and you say that in anger, those, those words, they hurt, they pierce us, they cut us, and they're hard to heal from. Or think about parenting. Maybe for those of you who had parents that told you that you're worthless, you're stupid, you're a mistake. We hear these words from our parents and they follow us throughout the rest of our life and we live our lives trying to reverse that type of speech, those words that we have heard because they hurt. Words are very, very powerful. And that's what Paul was going to get into here in Ephesians chapter 4. You see, the truth is we used to say this saying, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that is not true. Words can be soul-destroying. And so as a church, we have to be a church that's built on grace and authenticity and transparency. And that will lead us to speaking the truth in love because we will see ourselves as we are. To speak the truth in love simply means this. It means to put things as they are but clothed with the best interest of the other person in mind. I think often one of the problems that we enter into is that when we speak the truth, we do not clothe it in the parameters of love. We say it like this, why just tell it like it is? But look, truth without love isn't truth. And love without truth isn't love. The Bible calls us to speak both. And so when we share our hurts or our encouragement, when we share our pain or our needs, we must be willing to tell the truth as a church. But we must be willing to do that in love. So let's look at what Paul has to say here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. 
He says this, but speaking the truth in love, may we grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. But I want you to notice something. I purposely skipped over it. Look at the preceding verses. We are supposed to speak the truth in love, but the question is, to whom? Well, let's look at verse 14. He says, we should no longer be like children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. I think one of the hardest things to do is to speak the truth in love to our culture. To speak the truth in love to our culture is a very challenging thing to do because we want to be accepted. We want to be valued. We want to be loved. And so sometimes we really won't share with what's on our heart or what's on our mind. We'll clothe some of the things that we believe to be as true for the sake of being accepted by the people around us. But when it comes to being a Christian in our culture, we have the opportunity to influence our culture. I like to think of it like this. Our culture isn't our enemy. Our culture is the victim of our enemy. They've been saturated with certain lies about who they are and where they have come from and who they are called to be. And we have an awesome, a a wonderful opportunity in our jobs, at our schools, in our families, with our friends to be a light in the darkness and to speak that truth. Now here's the problem, Paul says. Paul says, first of all, uh, he says we. Notice that in verse 14. We need to be aware that we could be like children tossed to and fro. And so Paul is humble enough to place himself in this category that, look, sometimes our culture can influence us. Sometimes our culture overrides the truth that we know, and that's in our minds. And so we need to be aware that we shouldn't be like children tossed to and fro in the ways of the sea. And that's the powerful imagery that Paul brings to us, is that our culture If we're not willing to speak the truth in love, our culture will render us like a child, tossed in the oceans of the waves. Did you know that one of the leading causes of death for children between one and four years old is is dying from drowning? Isn't that crazy? I mean, other than like birth defects, drowning is the number one cause for children between one and four passing away. In fact, I have read reports that a one-year-old child can actually drown in up to an inch of water. That's it. An inch of water could take a child's life. Why? Because they're immature. They don't have the strength or the the knowledge to withstand that, that effect on their life. And so Paul here is using powerful imagery. I was at the beach a few summers ago, and the waves were picking up. We went to Nagshead, North Carolina. I love the Outer Banks. It's just peaceful. It's quiet. There are families around and not a bunch of crazy people, and we can just go there and relax. And uh, man, it's like every time I go to Ocean City, I'm telling you, every single time I go to Ocean City, there's like a group of 20 college people who are going there to party, and there's loud music, and there's cigarette smoke, and I'm like, I just want to relax and get away from people. <laughs> you ever feel like that? Well, go to Outer Banks. That's where you get to do that. But anyways, so we were at Outer Banks, and one day the ocean was pretty powerful, and we were right next to this pier, and we're relaxing, and next thing we know, there are a few people out there in the water, and then out, this looks, this young lady looks to be like nine or ten years old. She goes out in the water, she's next to this pier, and she's swimming, and all of a sudden she starts going out just a little bit farther, and a little bit farther. And then I see her trying to swim back, but she can't, she can't make it back. And so she turns on her back to try to back paddle out of the ocean, but it's just keeping her there, right next to this pier. I mean, she's lost strength. She's too small to fight the ocean. And so I'm like, dude, I think that girl's actually in trouble. And one of my friends who were there with me, I mean, immediately takes off and he ran out there. And I'm like, yay, good job, you know, saving her, cheering him on from from the sidelines. But he saves her, he grabs her by the arm, he pulls her to safety. I mean, she was just too weak to overcome the elements. And that's what it's like for a Christian who isn't willing to speak the truth and love. If you're not willing to stand upon the truth, You succumb to the impact of the elements around you. And so if we are going to speak the truth in love, we have to be willing to recognize what Paul says, the trickery of men. It's where false teachers come in, and they tell us something that may have a few nuggets of truth, but it's not absolutely true. It's not objectively true. This word trickery comes from the idea of dice playing. 
where you roll dice and you try to trick the other person and you use cups to masquerade. One of the first instances in Scripture that we find of this kind of trickery is Genesis chapter 3. There is Eve. She's standing with Adam. And actually, Adam's not there because she's just talking to Satan. But she's standing there and she's talking to Satan. And Satan asks her, he says, why don't you eat of this, of this tree? And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, Eve says, oh no, this is God's command to us, okay? Do not eat of the tree or touch it, lest you will surely die. Where did Eve get that command from? Well, she got that command from Adam. But that was not the command that God gave to Adam. God told Adam, don't eat of the tree, not don't eat and don't touch. And so we don't really know what Adam did in this moment. All we know is that Adam decided to put up these hedges around the tree. He didn't want Eve to eat of the tree, let alone even go near it. And so he added this little man-made rule, which somehow probably even made things worse. And that's what our culture does. No, you can't eat that. No, 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 you can't drink that. No, 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 you can't do that. No, 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 you can't look at that. No, 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 you can't go there. And we put up all these man-made rules and boundaries when the Bible doesn't say that. Why do we do that? Because we've fallen into this false idea and this trickery of men. When it comes to things that we eat, when it comes to things that we drink and we touch at, the Bible says go and do, but do it like this. And Satan's job is to twist it just a little bit to where you eat just a little too much or drink just a little too much, or touch outside of the boundaries that God has set up for us. That is the, tri- the trickery and the deceitfulness of men. And then Satan comes along to Eve, and he says this. Here's where the trick comes in. Has God really said? Is this really what God wants you to do? Does he really want you to work out your marriage? Does he really want you to be self-disciplined in this area of your life? Does he really want you to go and do these things on behalf of God? I mean, after all, God wants you to be happy, and your happiness is the most important thing. I mean, does God really want this for your life? That is the trickery of Satan. And we must recognize that he is the ultimate enemy trying to trick us and deceive us so that we can do something that God doesn't want us to do or prevent us from doing that which God wants us to do. And so here in Ephesians 4, Paul says, we must stand on the truth and speak the truth in love. We should not be held captive by the trickery of men. And then he goes on to emphasize just a little bit more. He says, or in the craftiness and deceitful scheming. This idea here in Ephesians 4, 15, uh, 14 and 15, it means this. It means a readiness to do anything. You're ready to lay a trap. You're ready to set a trick. You'll do whatever it takes. It's like we think about this, like a used car salesman. Sorry if you sell cars or your parents do, okay? I'm not talking about your parents. You know, preachers lie too. That doesn't mean I'm lying, okay? So anyways, so has God really said is the question. Satan was willing to do whatever it took. It didn't matter if he had to lie. It didn't matter what information he had to present. All that matters is the outcome. It doesn't matter if the car is broken or if that you, you, you buy something that's a piece of junk. What matters to the car salesman in that moment selling the car. And so we will find this. It doesn't matter, our culture says, if it's true. It doesn't matter if it's right. The only thing that matters is if I get my way. And so we must be willing to recognize these things. We must be willing to speak the truth and love in our culture and influence it in such a way that we can spread the truth. And here's the best way that you can influence yourself with the truth. Starve yourselves of false ideas And feed yourselves God's word. John 17 says God's word is truth. Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. And so if we will starve ourselves of the false ideas and the trickery of men. And fill ourselves with God's word. We will be able to speak the truth and love to our culture. But you know something else that I think about? How could we possibly go out there and speak the truth in love if we're not willing to start right here and speak the truth in love? You know, there are some churches, and I'm not up for looking at other people and name calling, but there are some churches that refuse to teach certain doctrines on Sunday morning because they don't want to offend people. They don't want people to leave the the church thinking, man, that's tough to believe, or man, that's tough to accept, or wow, that's a really hard calling to follow. Speaking the truth in love 
doesn't mean that I get to choose which truth I teach and which truth I don't. It means I must speak it in such a way that has the other person with their interests in mind. And so married couples, when you're ready to let out your heart and you're ready to let out your hurt, speak it in such a way that benefits the other person. When you are parents and your kids are driving you nuts, look, sometimes Piper drives me nuts, I need to speak to her in such a way that has her best interest in mind. And tell, telling the truth is tough, isn't it? It is tough. And so look what Paul goes on to say here in verses 22 through 27. He says this. He says, put off the old man considering your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt and according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so he's saying, first of all, look, that's how you used to be. You used to do whatever it took to sell that car or to get that job or to be in a relationship with that person. You used to lie and deceive and be crafty. That's who you used to be. Don't be like that anymore. That's the old you. Be the new you that God made you to be. And then he goes on to say this in verse 25. He says, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, he says in verse 26, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. That is good, that I may have something to give with him who is in need. And so the first thing that he says here is put on the new self. This is something that you make the decision to do. And it's tough. The old Rick Bonifield, that's me. Uh, you know how you say Richard in Chinese? Richard. <laughs> I know, that's terrible. Okay, I'm sorry, bad joke. So he says, put on the new self. This is something that you actively do. And look at the result of this. What are the, what are the ethical implications of putting on the new self? First of all, in verse 25, he says, you will lay aside falsehood and you will speak truth to each one. You won't, you won't sugarcoat it. You will tell the truth, but you'll do it in such a way that builds up the other person. And what's the result? Why should we do this? Look what he says. Because we are members of one another. Look, the reason why I tell the truth as best as I can is because we are connected together as family. I used to have a coach, Zanesville football, right? We were called the Zanesville Blue Devils, believe it or not. And uh, and he used to say, look, once you are a part of the Blue Devil family, you are a part of the Blue Devil family for life. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say, you're connected to this family, We will hold you accountable, and we will love you to make you be the best person that you possibly can be. That's the kind of attitude that we should have in the church. Why should we speak the truth in love? Why shouldn't we lie? Because we are members of each other. I mean, what if I looked in the mirror every day and I said, Rick, you are ugly. That is not the truth. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got one in there, okay? I was thinking, how could I do this again? But, But no, seriously, what if we were to lie to ourselves? For instance, what if her eyeball were to say, hey, look, there's really not a curve in the road. It's actually a straight, you know, a straight road. You'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? I mean, what if your body lied to itself constantly? I mean, think about that. A lot of you would be in really bad shape, George Zabatakis. Not to call you out or anything. Just kidding, George. Love you, man. And so that's what Paul says, that we are members of one another. He actually uses a quote from Zechariah chapter 8. And Zechariah chapter 8, we're not going to go there, but Zechariah looks forward to this beautiful, wonderful city of God with God's new people that dwell there. It's a futuristic prophecy. And he says they will speak to one another in truth. That's going to be a mark of true followers of God. They will speak to one another in truth, and they won't lie to each other, and they won't have to have a law that tells them to do so. They will do it. Why? Because they're God's people. He says in verse 26, they will be angry. Be angry, he says, but do not sin. He actually quotes from Psalms chapter 4 here. And the psalmist is writing in chapter 4 because people were accusing him of things that aren't true. They're bringing false accusation against him. Now, if somebody lied about you, what is your initial response? You probably would be angry, wouldn't you? I'd be like, how dare you lie about me? I mean, I'm ready to give you a knuckle sandwich in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it enrages us. I'm telling you right now, there's nothing like having somebody bear false witness about you. Even if the insinuation isn't true, it is absolutely enraging. And here's this psalmist writer in Psalms chapter 4. He is so angry because these people are lying about him and scheming against him. But then something happens. 
After he gets over his anger, and he really doesn't get over it, God intervenes. And it says in Psalms chapter, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, God replaced his heart with gladness and with peace. Have you ever felt that before? That moment of anger or rage, and you hold on to it, and then finally you let it go, and you let God fill you with gladness and with peace. People of the world don't do that. People of the world who have people lie about them, take them to a court of law, and sue them for every dime they're worth. People that lie about other people in the world and in our culture, they will blaspheme you back on Facebook, they will slander you back on Instagram, they will tweet about you as much as they can, and they will run your name in the mud. And isn't that what we kind of feel like in our culture right now, our political system? I mean, the left, first of all, the liberals that are called the left, and for those of you who aren't from around here, those, those are people who are more of the democratic persuasion, they're called the liberals, and then the conservatives are the republicans, right? And there's this great divide in American politics where each people are just throwing mud back and forth at each other. And it doesn't even matter if it's not true. As long as it sticks, that's the purpose that should be accomplished. As Christians, I don't view myself as a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. I view myself as a Christ follower. And if there are certain political ideas that match up with what I found in the Bible, that's what I follow. Because Christ is my King. He's number one in my life. And that should be the same thing for us. And so we shouldn't look at who's Democrat or who's Republican necessarily. Titles do have their purpose. But what we should do, if something is wrong and a Republican does it or says it, as Christians, we could say that is wrong. That isn't what God has for our life. And that's the same truth, same truth for the Democratic Party. We should be willing to stand on the truth of God's word and speak it in such a way that it has the best, best interest for the other person. This is something that we can influence as a Christian. And so I say you start with you. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. You know, sometimes I think people like to use this passage of Scripture as a license to be angry. I'm allowed to be angry, we say to ourselves. And every time we get angry, we point to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, and it says, see, be angry and do not sin, and I've got the righteous anger of God. You know how hard it is to have the righteous indignation, the righteous anger of God? That's really tough. You've got to remove yourself of prejudice, of personal offense. I mean, it is a tough thing to say, I am angry on God's behalf. I think when it comes to the right to life, being a champion for life, I think we can have the righteous anger of God and speak out for those who don't have a voice for themselves. And there are a lot of of ways, a lot of opportunities for us to express what God is angry about. But I know this to be true. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, James says this, Be quick to hear and slow to speak, for human anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And guess what? I'm a human. And nine times out of ten when I'm angry, it's not because of God's behalf. It's because of Rick Bonifield. And I would rather err on the side of being quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger than using Ephesians 4.26 to verify how I feel about myself. We must be very cautious when it comes to our anger. And while we can have the righteous indignation of God, a mark of biblical Christianity will be a person who doesn't sin in their anger. And so that's who we should be. We need to speak the truth in the church. We need to speak the truth in our conflict. And we need to be able to do it in such a way that builds up the other person. And the question is why? Look at verse 27. Why should we not sin in our anger? Here's what, here's what it says. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't give him a foothold, as maybe some of your translation says. It means a chance, a place, a possibility. And when we hold on to our anger and we let it seethe and we let it brood over and we let it boil up inside, Satan plants his foot right there and he starts wiggling and dividing the church in throughout. The whole point of Ephesians is on unity. Stay together. This is what a mature church looks like. And when a church is having people that hold on to their anger, Satan gets a foothold and he divides it and he separates it. Don't give the devil a foothold. He said in verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Sunset was like in the Old Testament and in history, it was this governing light. Once the sun went down, your activity stopped. Okay, there was a cutoff period. And so this isn't a legalistic requirement. Like literally you're sinning if if the sun goes down on your anger. Here's what he's saying is don't give Satan opportunity to get a foothold. 
Be reconciled. If you can do it today, do it as soon as you can, as soon as possible. Get this out. Get it over with. Bring yourselves back together because Satan will divide us against each other. He'll divide your marriage. He'll divide your kids. He'll divide the church. And so we need to be reconciled to one another. We, we cannot give Satan an opportunity to get, a, to get a foothold. Look what he goes on to say in verse 29. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. The stress in this passage of scripture on harmful words. He says, let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth. This word unwholesome is used for dead trees or rotten fish. It's abusive language, vulgar speech, slander, contemptuous talk. He says, don't do that. Don't give Satan a foothold. Don't let that be the outcome of of the fruit of your lips. Don't let those words come off of your lips. How should we speak, he says, what is good for edification or building up or that which will give grace to those who hear. You know, before you think about sharing something with someone else, you might want to think about this. Will this build them up to be what Christ has called them them to be or will this tear them down? We should think about the words that we say. And if we have to say something that's tough, may we say it in such a way that edifies them and edifies God. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says this, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. And this is written to the church. Listen, church, if you are going to be the church that I've called you to be, you've got to be a church built on grace. And when you're built on grace, you will see yourselves as you truly are. And it will make you an authentic person because you won't pretend to be something that you're not. And when you're a church that's authentic, you will know that authentic people tell the truth. And they do it in such a way with the best interests of the other person in mind. In verse 30, Paul says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do you know what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit? It means to make the Holy Spirit sorry. Do you want God to be sorry for saving you? Are you living your life in such a way that makes the Holy Spirit happy to be inside of your heart and inside of your life? Just live your life in such a way that does not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And here's the mark. Are you ready? This is the end of the sermon. And think of you, you guys are like, oh, blessed up. Finally, it's the closing, right? <laughs> Two passages of scripture that we, we, see that we see here. What are your marks? Are you living your life in such a way that grieves the Holy Spirit? Here's how you know. Verse 31. Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Are you bitter? To be bitter means to have resentment. It's a state of sharp hate. This Greek word used by Aristotle before it was used in the Bible, Aristotle says it's an attitude that creates lasting wrath, hard to reconcile, and sustaining anger for a long time. There are people that you've been angry at for two, three years, and you've never shared it. That is bitterness. That is bitterness to the core. And I'm not preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to me. There have been hurts in my life that I have held on to, and here I am right now, this year, I've finally been able to have those uprooted by the discipline of God. It is not easy, guys, holding on to those bitter feelings towards other people. And maybe you're even right but it defiles you. It makes you sour. It makes you so on edge that you are angry at everything. That's the mark of a person who's grieving the Holy Spirit. Another word that he uses here is wrath. It's an indignant outburst of rage. It's a short fuse. You've just had enough. And nine times out of ten, it happens over things that really aren't that big of a deal. Things just bother you, and you just explode, and you get angry about stuff that doesn't matter. The times you should be angry, you're silent, and the times you shouldn't be angry, you have an outburst of anger. That's a mark of grieving the Holy Spirit. The third word that he uses is anger. And this means, there's three words in the Greek for anger. This one means a steady festering or a seething anger. It's something that builds up slowly over time. And then finally, boom, I'm going to let you have it. I have had enough. (laughs) That's usually the mark of that one. I have had enough. I am up to here, right? Parents, you're like, amen, I know exactly what it's talking about. We can't get to that point. We can't get to that point. Another one he says is clamor. It means to scream loudly. Any of y'all come from shouting families? You yell at each other? 
Husbands and wives, you yell at each other. If you don't say you've ne- if you've said you've never yelled at the other person, I don't really believe you, okay? I don't believe you. We all lose our temper. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're a super chill person. I'm not going to impute that to you. I'm here to confess to you today. Angel and I, we've yelled at each other. And sometimes we have yelled at each other bad. And that is straight up sin. I wish I could tell you that when we meet together as elders, that we always get along, elders and ministers, we always get along. And we've never yelled at each other before. And that's not true. We have sinned in our anger. We are guilty. The question is, is, is there a pattern of behavior? Is this something that you're pursuing? Are you constantly grieving the Holy Spirit of God by clamoring and yelling at other people? That's why some of your translations means to brawl. It's a shouting match between two people. It can happen between parents. It can happen in the church. It can happen at our jobs. It can happen in marriages. And then finally he says slander. It means to blaspheme or profane speech. It's defamation. It's vilifying another person by telling something that is false or even gossip. That may be true, but it's none of the other person's business. What are your marks? If you were to read those things, you say, hey, man, that's that's a pattern in my life, and I'm grieving God's spirit inside of me. God might not be happy with me. He says this, let it be put away from you. And instead of doing that, look, Christianity is not just about what you shouldn't do. Christianity is much, much more. It is more about what you should do. And so if those sins mark your life, the question is, do these upcoming behaviors mark your life as a Christian? Look what he says in verse 32. Instead of doing those things, we should be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. First of all, he says you should be kind to one another. It means to be ental, uh, ental. That's easy and gentle made together. I am famous for making up words. So if this is your first time here, okay, I make up words all the time. I'm going to write my own dictionary, all right? My wife laughs at me all the time because I make up words because I talk really fast in case you haven't noticed. That's just me. That's what I do. And so he says you need to be kind to one another. This is not only just our attitude, but it's our actions ultimately. It doesn't come naturally. Being kind to one another doesn't come naturally. You know what the first thing I do when I get an egg? I crack it over a frying pan. Eggs are gentle. They need to be handled gently. We can't crack each other. we got to be kind and hold each other. Yes, I mean that physically, cracking each other, all right? Sometimes the elders come up and they smack me around a little bit. Sometimes I need it. Other times I don't. (laughs) We can't do that. We've got to be gentle. And look, that's the last thing you want to do because it's not natural. You want to tell people how you feel. But we need to be kind. Second of all, he says this, we need to be tender-hearted. It means to be compassionate. It means to be sympathetic. We need to be tender towards one another. That's what God's calling us to be. And then thirdly and finally, he says you need to forgive one another. It means to not hold another person's sins against them. That is the mark of Christianity. Kindness, tenderness, forgiveness. And here's the question. How should we forgive each other? Just, he says, as Christ also has forgiven you. That's the level of forgiveness that we are to have with each other. And so I thought it was appropriate that as a church, these are the people that we want to be like. This is who we want to live like. This is who we want to strive to be like. And Paul ends this section, and I know it's different in your Bible because the different chapters are broken up. But in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul simply says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you ask yourself, what's it there for? In conclusion of everything that we've just discussed, Paul says, be God's child. Be imitators of God. This is how God has treated us. This is how we should be treating each other. God doesn't do those things to us that we listed in Ephesians, Ephesians 4.31. God pursues us like Ephesians 4.32. He is kind, he is compassionate, and he is forgiving. And that's what it means to be a child of God. I had this really weird thing. Some of you may be able to understand this. Uh, if you've had parents that uh, called you stupid or you were worthless or somehow you got that thought in your mind. But what was weird for me is my dad was actually, he was, he was a pretty cool guy. All right, My dad was pretty cool. He died when I was 14, most of you know that, and I had this weird thing that happened to me that even though my dad loved me and he'd say, how's my big boy, he'd give me a hug, excited to see me, when my dad died, I kind of felt like he abandoned me in some way, shape, or form. 
And I had for eight years, eight years, I would have nightmares about once a week that my dad, I was a little kid, it's really weird, I was a little kid and my dad would always choose my stepbrothers over me. I'd go to knock on his door to see my dad and he would tell me to get out of here and he'd close the door in my face. And I developed this idea just for my dad dying. I developed this idea that I wasn't my, my, my dad's son. I, at times I've even questioned, is my dad really my dad? I mean, that's, that's trickery. That's craftiness. That's deceit. And sometimes we listen to the world around us and we hear all of these voices and all of these ideas and all of these things that tell us what we are not. And we open up the truthfulness of God's word, just like Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 15, he says, I eat the word of God. I digest it and it goes down into my inward parts. He says, this is who I am. I tell myself the truth. And the truth, speaking the truth in love, is that if you have obeyed the gospel, if you are a Christian... You are God's child. It doesn't matter what your parents have said about you or what your spouse has yelled at you or even what your kids may say about you. It doesn't matter if you haven't been great at your job or you've made mistakes in your past. If you are a Christian, the Bible says you are God's child. And you're not that terrible child that's run off that nobody wants to talk about. I mean, if I could picture it like this, it's like God has one of those dad wallets. You know what I mean? And he opens it up, like one of those old school wallets. Now we have our phones for everything. And it, and it falls down, and there are, are 20 pictures of you inside of it. And he goes and he shows it to the angels in heaven or whoever else is up there. And he says, look, I want, you to, I want you to look at my son. I want you to look at my daughter. Look at how awesome they are. Look at all the great memories we've had together. This is my child. This is my son. This is my daughter. And that's true for you. And that's true for me. You are a child of God, and that is the truth. May we be a church that speaks the truth in love and lives as children of God. Don't let anybody take that away from you. Let's stand and let's pray.